We've done it. Back in the game. Yes. Yes. I love YouTube. So good. So good. I love it. I love it. It's amazing. Right. Cool. Right. That's what I think of YouTube. Uh, Should have done Twitch. Should have done Twitch. Yeah. Could have spammed like... I could have should have made like just really bad chemistry like emotes or something. Gone on Twitch, sorted it. Okay. Right. There were we. Uh we were doing electrolysis stuff. Yeah. When you when you're above carbon, the only way to extract it is electrolysis. Done. Yeah, woo, amazing. Right. Uh, any other topic requests? I know there's one topic request for um, energy calculations. So, oh, here's one I've prepared earlier. Um, okay. Uh, so uh, this is um, a past paper question. Um, <coughs> we're going to switch to normal pens for these because my printer's fun. Um this is a past paper question looking at the O energy change. So uh, actually, before we do, we need to make sure that uh, we are happy with uh, energy changes. So there are two types of kind of reaction. You either have uh, an exothermic reaction or you have an endothermic reaction. Okay, this is like free science lessons and Primrose Kitten merged into one just subpar kind of thing. They, they don't drink a cup of tea live on stream. Okay, so um, two types of reactions. Exothermic means uh, release heat. Okay, that means that in the reaction, uh, heat is released uh, as you, uh, you know. That is a top quality quote. Uh, in uh, an endothermic reaction, uh, heat or uh, is is takes um, is taken in. Okay. Now, actually, if we want to make it more precise, instead of heat, we should be talking about energy. Okay. Um, and that's because photosynthesis, for instance, you've just done that in um, your biology paper one, is an endothermic reaction because it takes in energy, but not in the form of heat, but in the form of light. Cool. Um, so we've got two types of reaction. And whenever we have a reaction, what we tend to do is uh, we break up all of the atoms um, and uh, we, we break up all the atoms and then they reform into their um, new compounds. So uh, if I take something like uh, methane, looks like that kind of okay and I react it with oxygen okay what happens is uh, they break up okay and uh, all your bonds here so the bonds between the carbon and the hydrogen and between the oxygens are all broken up okay and we essentially get a pile of atoms. Like that. Okay. And then, uh, like the Terminator, they kind of all reform into their new uh, components. So, for instance, uh, the carbon... Uh, will join with, oh no, that's blue, ruined it. Uh, we'll join with uh, the oxygens, we get carbon dioxide, and we'll also have two waters, okay? So, whenever we have a reaction, we have our reactants, 
all the bonds are broken up, then they're remade and we get uh, new bonds. This is kind of like, no, you haven't missed bonding. I'm kind of going all over the place. Uh, this is kind of like um, when you do Lego, right? He says, as the nerd I am, um, if you get a big box of Lego, chances are you've still got little bits made up from when you last played of it. And then you break it all up and into bricks and then you make your new stuff. So um, this kind of breaking bonds kind of bit here. And then here I am making new bonds. And if I had to think about what that is, um, if you if you everyone knows uh, like a really overly affectionate couple which do too much PDA, and if you want to separate them, that really um, that really takes effort, right? So if you want to separate these atoms here, they're like that overly affectionate couple. It takes effort to break them apart. Okay. Um, then when they go back together, they kind of feel really happy, feel really warm inside, and they all snap back together, okay? So if we think about um, what happens, we need to remember the mnemonic. Uh, oh, no, you've done the classic, haven't given enough room, amateur hour. Uh, it's not died. It's not died. Calm yourself. I hope it's not died. Um, all right, let's go for a nice light yellow. Um, Bendomex, okay, and that's the uh, breaking bonds is endothermic. Okay, and that making bonds is exothermic. Okay, yeah, it's not dead. I don't know where you're chatting. I know that my internet's rubbish. Deal with it. Uh, what about triple students? They don't exist as far as I'm concerned. Um, no. Um, so we've got um, uh, breaking bonds is, is uh, endothermic, making bonds is exothermic. So if I go back to that reaction that I have, uh, boom, All right? Um, if I was to draw a graph, okay? Uh, if I was to draw a graph, um, here, if I had the energy involved, and here is the kind of reaction time or progress or whatever. At the start, I've got uh, this many, this much energy kind of locked away in my reactants. So I had uh, CH4 plus uh, two lots of O2 in this reaction. Okay. And to break bonds, that takes, uh, that takes energy. So what happened, okay, is uh, the, uh, I have to put energy into the reaction to break up all those bonds. So up here, they're kind of at their, they're like atoms. Not really, but we'll just pretend that they are. Okay. Um, then we make new bonds and this releases energy. So um, this is kind of like a store of energy, right? When I break bonds, because I'm having to put energy in, the amount of energy inside goes up. And then when I make new bonds and I release energy, the amount of energy inside has gone away. Okay. So over here, uh, we've got the products. So there's two things that we need to look at on this graph. First of all, uh, this bit here, okay, EA sports, um, which is the uh, activation uh, energy. Okay, and when we go, when we think back to what we do in a uh, in a reaction, okay, we break all of the bonds. So activation energy is the energy put in to break all the bonds.
the other thing which we need to look at on this graph is the comparing the start and the end. Okay, if the uh, products are below the reactants, then it is an exothermic reaction. Okay, so this, for instance, is an exothermic reaction because the level has gone down. That means the amount of energy locked away has gone down. It's been given out to the surroundings. Things have got warmer. So an endothermic uh, reaction, exo an endothermic reaction is kind of the opposite. That's when the start level is below the end level. So this right here is an endothermic process. Okay. So exothermic, they end up below. Endothermic, they end up higher. And I'm kind of going to come full circle because there's not actually much on the energy changes topic. You just need to know what an exothermic and an endothermic reaction is. What actually happens in a reaction, which is you break bonds and then you uh, make uh, new bonds. And the other thing uh, is these reaction profiles where you have exothermic where they end up below, endothermic where they end up above. And that the activation energy is from the base level up to the top of the hump. Okay, let's put that into some form of context. You can be asked to calculate the own energy change of reaction. Um, this is going to be more high. If they give you this for foundation, I think that's pretty uh, annoying and pretty tough. I wouldn't worry about this too much. More of a foundation, uh, more of a higher thing. So, turns out this is the exact reaction which I drew in circles on there. Okay. If if you uh, have you have a look, what I'm going to do is I'm going to break all the bonds, and then I'm going to make uh, these new bonds. So. Um, here in this methane, I've got a C to H covalent bonds. All right, I've got one of them. So if I break that, that that's now apart. But I haven't just got one. I've got four of them. So on the left-hand side, I've got four lots of these C to H bonds. Okay. I've also got two lots, because it's a big two, of these O to O double bonds. Like that. And you'll always be get given a table which lists the bond energies of those um, substances. So, for instance, here I get told that each CH bond takes 413 joules to break. Because remember, when I break bonds, it takes energy. When I make bonds, it gets released. So that would be four times 413 which equals 1,652, bit quick maths. Uh, you can use a calculator, obviously. Uh, two times 498. Uh, yes, it does. Doesn't matter what way around it is. It's, it's only how they're linked, okay? Um, two times 498 is 996. Okay, do you really want me to have to start, like, man in the chat? Um, if I then add them up, okay, 1,652 plus 9,996 gives us 1, 000, uh, 2,648. So that means that to break all of those bonds takes 2,648 uh, kilojoules a mole per mole. On the right-hand side, Okay, I need to make all of these bonds. Okay, so I've got a C to O double bond, two of them. And I've got one, two, three, four, okay, uh, OH bonds. Okay, so if I look here, I've got two times 498 which gives us 996, uh, CO, 805, idiot. Okay, which gives us 1,610. Uh, four times 464, which uh, equals 1,856. If I add them up, okay, uh, I will get 
Uh, two, 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 two. Three thousand and something. See, my phone's in there. I'd ask. I'd ask Siri. Um, right, we'll have a cheeky, cheeky pretzel while I work it out. Six, six, four, three, four, six. Boom. Okay. So, um, if I, uh, I've now got how much energy I put in to break the left hand side. I've now worked out how much energy I would make by um, having the right hand side done. And all you need to do is you always, no matter what, even if it ends up as a minus number, you do left minus right every time. Okay, so that will be 2,648 minus 3,400. 66 okay which is another number okay which is minus 818 okay uh, kilojoules per mole now because it's a minus number okay that means um, that it is an exothermic reaction, okay? Negative energy change means an exothermic reaction because um, overall, that means um, that energy is given out from a reaction because I started off at one point, it's then gone down and that means it's gone, okay? That is uh, in the whole of the energy changes one. Don't care about that. Um, Okay, uh, hello Charlie. I don't have sausage hands. I'm not picking my nose. Uh, like that. Boom. Okay, I'm not a performing monkey. I mean, I could just go and play like Assassin's Creed or something. Um, okay, they're already dead. They're already dead. Right, uh, next thing, anyone uh, want anything they want me to go through now? Yeah, she's in, she's in, she's in the other room. Uh, has anyone got anything they want me to go through? Up to you. Quantitative. Uh, so quantitative, uh, no, I'm not gonna give you a, a wave, Ryan. Um, Right, uh, quantitative isn't actually much in foundation quantitative, and actually is not even that much in higher quantitative. Uh, quantitative basically boils down to can you calculate RFM? That stands for um, relative uh, formula mass. Um, the other, th the other thing um, that you need to be able to do is uh, let's trans transfer to something else. Um, if you uh, uh, you also need to be able to uh, do uh, concentration, okay? Um, and know that concentration is uh, mass divided by volume. Uh, for higher people, you also need to know that concentration could also be moles divided by volume. Okay, um, that's basically the actual difficult stuff. That's it. Um, so relative formula mass, I think, um, is one of those things where um, if you do uh, if you do it nice and meticulously, and you're not you're not skimping on working out, it'll actually all be all right. It's actually all pretty easy. So uh, if you take something like uh, magnesium carbonate, which is MgCO3, uh, the first thing that you uh, want to do is look at how many of each atom there are. So I've got Mg, there's no little number associated with it. So that means that there is one uh, magnesium atom. Okay, uh, there is no little number associated with the carbon. So that means that there is one carbon atom. And there are, there's a little three there for the O. So that means that there are um, three oxygen atoms. 
Okay. And then I want to look on the periodic table. Now, there is a whole unit, obviously, in this exam about the periodic table. But the key bit of information I want you to take away is that there is a key in the periodic table that you get given on the exam. Okay, it tells you what all of the numbers are. Okay, um, so you have um, at the top, you'll have the relative atomic mass. We can think of that as the mass number. Then you have the symbol. And then uh, the at the bottom, you have uh, the atomic number. Okay, now if you're... Um, Right, uh, I'll do practicals next. Um, after relative atomic mass, okay, so if you think about mass number, that is the number of protons and neutrons in uh, an atom, and the atomic number is the number of protons, okay? Um, so when I go back to this, I'm calculating relative formula mass. So funnily enough, out of these two numbers, I'm going to be looking at the mass number. So if you're not sure, look at the key because it will tell you everything. Okay. Um, so uh, if I look at the big number on the periodic table, magnesium will actually be 24. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to write exactly what I've just written, but replacing the symbols with the mass number. Okay. So that would be 24 times 1 because I've got one of them. 12 times 1 and 16 times 3. If you're wondering where these numbers come from, it's the bigger number on the periodic table, the top number. Okay, right. Um, can we calm down with the random stuff on the chat? Because I don't really want to get to school and have to fill out any pink forms. <sighs> right, so 24 times 1 is, uh, is 24. Okay. 12 times 1 is 12, and 16 times 3 is 48, okay? Um, so all I have to do is then add them up, okay, uh, which would be 84, okay? And that means that the relative formula mass of magnesium carbonate is 84. Cool. It's less for you, Ryan. You've got bigger things to worry about than a pink form, haven't you? Um, so, uh, that's how we calculate uh, relative formula mass. Boom. Now, uh, we've had uh, random practical stuff that people want to be asked about. Now, the required practicals in this are... Uh, you've got uh, making uh, a hello Rico. By the way, ooh, let's go away, Rico. Awesome. Um, so, um. If you uh, if you uh, think about the practicals, we've got making uh, soluble salts. Um, we have got um, electrolysis, which um, I did go over at the start. Actually, um, we have then uh, done uh, the other one. You've got energy chain. Um, which is all to do with um, adding different metals to, uh, to um, copper sulfate and then looking at the energy change. So let's take them one by one. Uh, making soluble salts is the one that you've probably done to death, okay? So when you're doing uh, making soluble salts, okay, you have got uh, some really key steps, okay? Um, you uh, we will need a, a metal oxide, okay, and an acid, and you're going to react them together, okay. Um, so, for instance, say the question asks you to make um, iron 
sulfate. Okay, you need to pick. Um, you need to pick the um, the metal oxide and the acid um, that will make iron sulfate. Right? Seriously, just if you're going to start prattling around with the chat, I'll just turn the chat off. The reason the chat's there is so that if you have something you want me to go through, we can do it. Okay? Because the first of all, your meme level is awful. Okay. And second, I just, you know, whatever. Just don't be a prat. You've got exams tomorrow. You're meant to be revising rather than trying to come up with something witty. Um, you'll have plenty of time to do that when you're on the dole. So um, that was a really bad joke. Uh, you've got metal oxide and acid, okay? Um, so you've, you've, uh, you want to make iron oxide. You've got um, metal oxide and acid. As I said, repeated about five million times. So the metal oxide you're going to have for this one is going to be iron oxide. Um, so uh, the acid you've got, because um, it's a sulfate, the acid you'll want is sulfuric acid. Okay, so you've got um, every uh, acid has its own salt. So, for instance, sulfuric acids will make sulfates. If you get asked about uh, nitrates, that will be uh, nitric acid, funny enough. The one, what, the hardest one to remember is uh, chloride, uh, which comes from hydrochloric acid. So if you need to make a chloride, you would have uh, hydrochloric acid. Right. Um, <clears throat> so... Iron oxide plus sulfuric acid is what you're going to use to make uh, iron sulfate. Then the practical steps, okay? Um, first of all, okay, you would take a beaker of the acid, okay, and you would add, so this is, this would be the sulfuric acid, okay, and then you would add the um, iron oxide. And bear in mind what this is will change. If you had to do um, copper sulfate, you would use copper oxide. If you had to do uh, magnesium chloride, you would have magnesium oxide and uh, hydrochloric acid. So that changes every time. So what you're going to do is you're going to add that in. Okay, so the first step will be uh, add uh, the metal oxide to the acid. Okay. Um, next. You're going to stir, okay? You want to stir it, make sure that everything's fully reacted. Um, you'll have some unreactive stuff in the bottom, so you keep adding until no more reacts. Okay, so you're now going to have um, unreactive stuff in the bottom. Okay, organic chemistry is paper two. Um, you're going to have some unreactive stuff in the bottom. Um, and what that means is you are going to have to uh, filter it. Okay, you have to filter it. So now you have got um, your unre your um, solution, your, your salt dissolved in it like that. So you need to get um, the, um, the salt out. So the way you do that, is uh, you uh, you kind of boil it, so you put it on the Bunsen burner, evaporate um, the uh, the the water. Okay, so you boil um, and evaporate the water, but you don't evaporate it fully because um, then you'll just get powder. So what you have to do is you then leave it to slowly evaporate. Okay, um, in an evaporating dish. So the key steps, and I, I've obviously done these very one wordy and bullet pointy, okay, is you add the metal oxide to the acid. If it's metal carbonate, you could add a metal carbonate, okay. It's just you add the solid to the acid. Uh, you stir it. You keep adding until no more dissolves. You're then filtering the solution, uh, putting it on a Bunsen burner, taking off as much of the liquid as possible, um, and then uh, you leave it to slowly evaporate, okay. Now, couple of things first of all uh if you're really stuck draw a diagram because uh, you can get marks from the diagram i don't know what that m is and is uh you need to say something about safety 
the explicit. If it says you don't need to, okay. That is the soluble salts practical. Electrolysis, I went through at the start. Um, you can go back and have a look if you want to at some point. The energy changes practical. Okay. Um, lovely. It's totally Jurassic Park. Um, okay. Um, <coughs> The uh, next one is energy and is practical. Now, we did this in class with a uh, polystyrene cup. It is we uh, put in uh, something like copper sulfate and a thermometer. Okay. Then we added a set amount of, of metal to that. So I could say, for instance, add magnesium in there and look at the energy change. Okay, so this practical is looking at, basically it's two things at once. It's the energy changes and it's the chemical changes uh, displacement reactions. So uh, remember when we did, I just showed you earlier about the reactivity series. If something is more reactive, it displaces it. Okay, so in this case, magnesium is more reactive than the copper. So let's look about the equation that we would get. We would, if we had uh, magnesium plus uh, copper sulfate, what will happen is the magnesium will replace the copper because it's more reactive. Okay, and you'll end up with uh, copper plus magnesium sulfate. Okay, um, so that is um, a displacement reaction where you have a more reactive metal replacing a less reactive metal. So when you take it back to the practical, um, the more the, the bigger the gap on the reactivity series, the more reactive the metal is that you've added, the more exothermic the reaction would be. So you take the temperature at the start, and you take the temperature at the end. So let's do this as just an example, okay? And I, they very much like, this is one of the ones where they really like to, um, they really like to uh, talk about like metal X, Y, and Z. They love to like, um, uh, like this is the point where they, they like to make you work it out. And say at the start the, of all of them, they're about 20 degrees. And at the end, uh, this one might be 32, this one might still be 20, and this one 28. Uh, so if I look at the change, Okay, uh, this one has gone up by 12, this one has not changed, and this one is an eight. Uh, so what that means is, is Y did not react because there was no change. So that means that the metal that you have added is lower in the reactivity series than the metal there. So if I, for instance, uh, was a baller and added gold, gold is less reactive than copper, okay? So that means it wouldn't react and therefore wouldn't get a temperature change. Up here, okay, if I um, added something like magnesium, I might get a good temperature change like 12. If I added something like iron, which is not as reactive, you would get a temperature change of 8. Okay, so if I had to look at these in order of reactivity, Y is less reactive than Z, which is less reactive than uh, X. Okay, so a couple of things that I can ask you is, first of all, if you, if you wanted to do the practical, what are the steps? Well, I kind of outlined them as I was doing this, okay? First of all, you would add a set amount to the cup. You then take the start temperature, okay? You would then um, add the metal and then measure the temperature at the end or when the temperature doesn't stop rising. They really like to ask on this, um, what are your control variables? So uh, if you remember, control variables are things that you keep the same in the reaction, okay? So, for instance, um, if you're wanting to look at the different metals, 
Okay. Um, if you want to look at the different metals, are we seriously going to do this? Good move. Okay. Um, if you're going to look at what you're going to keep the same, okay. Um, flame test isn't in this. Uh, fractional distillation is not this. Okay. So, no, fractional distillation is not in this one. Fractional distillation is paper two. Um, so, um, things that you want to keep the same in this experiment. If you're looking at the different metals, you want to make sure that you're either adding the same mass, you want to say that you're adding the same uh, length, or something like that, or either one of those. Uh, you could be wanting to say, um, you could... Uh, want to keep the same surface area. So what I mean by the same surface area is if you're using um, if you're using uh, powder, make sure everyone uses powder. Um, if you're using uh, the just little bits of metal, make sure you're using uh, little bits of metal. Um, so keep that the same. Um, now notice here that I've said mass or length. Um, do not say amount so don't say add the same amount of magnesium okay don't say add the same uh let um sorry don't yes yeah, don't say that you add the same amount of metal okay um always talk about the same mass always talk about the same length um yeah that is they do like to talk about that the other thing they also like to ask about this one is improvements so um ways that you can make the experiment better um so polystyrene cup is a really good one as i said because uh, that reduces energy loss uh, you can talk about having a lid on it okay if you have a lid on it then uh, you're gonna have less energy loss at the top um you could use a more accurate thermometer something like a digital thermometer uh, anything like that, anything which is going to reduce the energy loss and make sure that the only energy change is going to be due to um, the actual reaction. Uh, cool. I think that's actually the main practicals. Uh, right. What do you want me to go through next? Um, anything at all? uh anything anything at all anyone wants me to go through i've done electrolysis uh atomic structure yeah i can do that and go into bonding because i think bonding's the big one actually um revision tips uh summarize never copy um so uh if i uh da -da -da -da, uh titration we don't do triple um so, uh, bond uh, and stuff like that. So, first of all, uh, the atomic structure and the periodic table stuff, um, you need to know the uh, history of the atom. So, you start off um, uh, with Dalton, and he says that atoms are like uh, solid balls. Oh, the chat's going to love that. Um, then what happens is... Uh, is um, you uh, you discover these negatively charged particles called electrons, okay? Um, and I always like I, I've always uh, I always like to think about this as like Easter eggs. If you've never seen an Easter egg before, okay, you'd assume that it's solid chocolate, okay? But you but obviously we know Easter eggs aren't okay. They're hollow, or if they're like a Smarties one, they've got little Smarties inside. So imagine that you thought the atom was solid, but now suddenly you've discovered there's these little bits inside. So you know that it can't be solid. So um, this is uh, the uh, the JJ Thompson model of, it's actually no P, uh, JJ Thompson model of the atom, which is, uh, we call the plum pudding. Okay. Now, um,
Uh, cool. Um, so, uh, we've got the plum pudding model. Now, what happens is uh, Ernest Rutherford came along and he did an experiment called the gold foil experiment. Now, what he did is he got a very thin piece of gold foil. Now, remember that at this point, we think the atoms are like this. Okay. Uh, you do not need to learn gas chromatography and mass spectrometry. I can't emphasize that enough. Okay. That is complete. Don't need it. Okay. Um, the only th and chromatography, if any, anyway, is paper two. So you can take the gr gas chromatography and the mass spectrometry and you can screw it up and just throw it out the window. Um, yeah, well, if that sneaks into the paper, whatever. Um, it's not meant to be in there. And uh, the only thing that they could ask you is they could ask you about grass chromatography in the context of normal chromatography. So they could ask you to calculate an RF value, okay? Um, but uh, they uh, they could ask you to calculate a an RF value, but they um, it's using the same type of thing as uh, normal uh, chromatography. Anyway, uh, Rumford, he took, got that thin piece of gold foil, which we think is like this, all made up of those plum pudding atoms, and he fires radiation at it, okay? And if we assume that the atoms are like the plum pudding model, okay, you've only got these tiny little electrons in here, and the rest of it is just vague positive charge, right? And you are firing this whopping great positive thing at it, Okay, and there's clearly nothing there which would actually stop it. So what you, uh, it's actually alpha radiation. So um, that's, uh, I didn't want to mention it because I didn't want to, uh, um, I didn't want to start going into radiation, which is uh, the physics paper. Um, but an alpha particle is, uh, we know now is two protons and two neutrons, but we also don't know that at the moment. Okay, um, so size radiation of the atoms and we'd expect them to all go through and actually when he, does, he finds out that most of them do indeed go all the way through okay we've got a detector here and you can pick up the most of them go through but then what he did is he thought okay sod it let's look at it at different points and he noticed that actually if he put the detector here occasionally the radiation would come in and it would bounce right back at him okay so this is obviously quite surprising okay this um this is bizarre because if I've if the atoms like this, I'd expect the radiation to go right through. Now that means it can't do that. Okay, it means that this atom idea of the atom is wrong. Okay, that means that this is wrong because there's nothing to bounce it back. So what um, Rutherford said is instead of having this vague positive charge, all of the positiveness is concentrated in the middle. At a bit called the nucleus and around the outside the electrons would kind of whiz about like this okay so the radiation most of the time just went straight through but occasionally the alpha particle would come towards the nucleus and bounce off like that okay so rutherford has discovered the nucleus okay so that's why this is wrong because there's nothing to stop it. Whereas this one is, um, it fits the data better. Okay, so we've got the uh, the plum, uh, the Rutherford one. Now the next guy is someone called Niels Bohr, um, and uh, he's even more boring than me. Um, he's a maths man, and what he does is he realizes that instead of doing this random kind of Big Bang theory. Um, uh, type of thing they have these kind of set orbits like this where the electrons will just go round and round and round okay they have these kind of set orbits okay the other thing is um, and they loved this last year and that made everyone incensed is uh, James Chadwick discovers the neutron okay Pop. there we go all done now uh, that leads us to uh, the atomic structure model that we need to know, okay? That is that we have uh, protons and neutrons in the nucleus, and we have these shells going around the outside, 
Now, so we have uh, protons, neutrons, and electrons. Okay, if I have to look at, um, uh, I then need to know the charge and the mass. So po protons are positively charged, uh, neutrons have no charge, and electrons are negatively charged. Okay, um, protons and neutrons have a mass of one, and electrons, they don't have a mass of zero, it's very small or negligible, okay? So, let's now put all that together. Um, you need to be able to look at any, um, you need to look at any uh, atom on the periodic table and be able to tell me how many protons, neutrons, and electrons there are. So if I go on the periodic table and I, for instance, look at iron, iron has a top number of 56 and a bottom number of 26. So first of all, what are these numbers? I said this earlier. Um, this is the mass number. OK, and that is the number of uh, protons and neutrons. OK, um, this one down here is the atomic number. Um, and this is the number of protons. And this is what defines the element. Any element, OK, with the uh, with 26 protons is, is, is iron. OK, that's what makes iron iron is having 26 protons. OK, and 56, that's the mass number. So that tells me how much each atom of, uh, of uh, iron weighs. Now, again, if you're stuck, there is a key in the exam. Look on the periodic table. There is a key. So let's go back to this. I want to know the number of protons, neutrons and electrons. Well, first of all, the protons is really easy because that's the bottom number. That's the atomic number, 26. OK, now the electrons have to be the same. OK, because um, in an atom, protons equals electrons um, because protons are positively charged. Electrons are negatively charged. So they have to cancel each other out. Otherwise, the atom has an overall charge. And that's what we call an ion. So protons equals electrons. So that means I've got 26 protons, which means I have 26 electrons. Uh, yes, it's live. Um, uh, a bomb. Um, the neutrons is going to be the top number minus the bottom number. OK, we're not even going to bother with that word. Especially because he spelt it the American way. Um, so 50 um, minus uh, 20, 56 minus 26 will give us the number of neutrons. OK, so uh, 56 minus 26 gives us 30 neutrons. OK, so that's how you work out all the particles. When I then uh, look at the atom structure. OK, we're not going to bother about our FE. You need to be able to draw the electronic structure of the first 20 elements. OK, so um, in terms of what that means, OK, you um, uh, if I take sulfur, OK, if I look on the periodic table, um, you'll see that. So that means that it has got uh, 16 protons, 16 electrons and 32 minus 16, which is 16 neutrons. OK, so if I'm to plot that, um, first of all, I'm going to draw the symbol in the middle. And then um, I'm going to start to draw my electrons on. Now, uh, the first ring can take two electrons. The second can take eight. The third can take up to eight. And then the fourth one will say two because things get weird after 20. You're only ever going to be asked about um, the first 20 anyway. OK, so uh, two can go in the first ring. So I've got 16 to go in there. So one, two. So that means I've got 14 left to go. OK. Um, uh, then actually it's then uh, it's not it's not that. Macaulay, don't try and outsmart people. Um, then uh, I've got eight to fit in here. So um, this is this is really important, okay? Um, because if you do it this way, um, you uh, it makes the bonding easier, as we'll see. Okay, um, it's actually two, eight, eighteen, uh, thirty-two, um, and so on and so forth. It's actually much weirder than that. 
okay? Um, so don't worry about it. We can go 2882, okay? So um, I, uh, I've got 16 to fit in, put two in the first string. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so I'm now up to 10, okay? I've got 16 to go. Uh, yes, it does go beyond that in A-level. Um, I've now got six more to put on because I've filled in two. And again, remember the way that I'm going around, okay? 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 9 o'clock. I've now got two more, and they then pair up. So that is the electronic structure of sulfur, okay? And we follow the same rules for everything else. Okay, bonding. Okay, um, <clears throat> this is the thing where I always go on about atoms. What they want is a full outer shell, okay? That's what they crave. That's what they want for Christmas. And there's three ways that they can do it, okay? Um, I'm not wasting him, am I, because I've, uh, I've drawn on them. So uh, if I, um, if I, uh, blah, 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 blah. yeah, it doesn't really matter. Um, it doesn't really matter as long as you go around um, and you spread out. Um, the waste low, I've already written on it. I don't know if it's not really a waste, is it? Um, so if I, uh, where was I, uh, bonding, what I want is a full out shell. So if I take something uh, like metals, okay, they tend to have, if I look at, um, uh, if I look at the electronic structure of them, they'll tend to have just too many electrons. So for instance, uh, sodium, okay, I have two in the first shell, eight in the second, and one in the third, okay? Now, on this note, it's actually a really good point to, to, point to emphasize that group one all have one electron in the outer shell. That's why they call group one, okay? So uh, potassium has one in the outer shell, uh, lithium has one in the outer shell, so on and so forth, okay? If I look at the other end, okay, group seven, which are also called the halogens, uh, these are non-metals over here, okay? Um, you uh, you have not quite enough, okay? Um, not quite enough. So uh, something like chlorine will have, because group seven, will have seven in the outer shell, okay? And you can see that if I want to make this a full outer shell, all you need to do is um, is add an electron, Okay. So really you can separate things into two categories, metals and non-metals, okay? Now, um, what that means is, is we've got different ways of them combining in uh, to, uh, to bond. So metals, non-metals, okay. Now, uh, if metals are on their own, and I have metals bonding with other metals, okay, um, that is metallic bonding. Okay, that's metallic bonding. If I have metals and non-metals react, that is what we call ionic bonding. And if I have non-metals with other non-metals, that is covalent bonding. In terms of what happens to the electrons, okay, in terms of what happens to them, in ionic bonding, you get this swap. So remember I've just said that metals have a little bit too many electrons, have a few too many electrons. Non-metals don't quite have enough. What happens is because they have slightly too many, they swap it and they give the electrons to the non-metals. And that means uh, that you uh, you kind of have this swap slash trade of electrons or transfer is another word. Okay. Um, metallic. Uh, bonds uh, because metals have those not quite, they just have slightly too many what happens is uh, they will kind of um, uh, what's called delocalized they'll kind of exist around uh, the metals um, and uh, we have what we're going to say our delocalization that means they don't stay in one place okay um, last one over here uh, covalent um, is where we have a share 
of electrons. So they don't quite have enough, and what they do is uh, they all kind of come together and share. Cool. So um, let's go back to this up here, okay? If I take sodium, which has got one electron in its outer shell, and I take fluorine, which has got seven, I'm going to do its dots this time. Okay, you can see that this one uh, needs to lose one. This one needs to gain one. And what happens is that electron is then transferred over there, and I end up with sodium fluoride. Like that, okay? Now, um, what that means is, is because we've got this change and exchange of electrons, there is uh, now an imbalance, okay? Um, so because I've got slightly uh, too many electrons here, that means that this is negatively charged, okay? This one here, because it's lost electrons, is positively charged. That's, in a weird way, actually quite um, like a reverse. It's quite bizarre, okay? Because it's lost electrons, but it's now positive. And that's because electrons are uh, negative, okay? So that is ionic bonding. Now, the couple of, that's basically it. There's a couple of uh, quirks with this. If I took something like uh, magnesium, which has got two in its outer shell, and oxygen, which has got six, you can see that this one would want to lose two, and this one would want to gain two. And we get that trade, okay? And we end up with uh, magnesium and oxygen, or an oxide iron as it is now. Okay, now because um, this one has lost two electrons, that means it's now two plus. And because this one has gained electrons, it's now two minus, it's gained two, so it's now two minus. And this one has lost electrons, so it is um, uh, two plus, okay? That is uh, the first quirk is that you can gain or lose t um, multiple ones. The other variation on that is if I take something like uh, magnesium again, and I take something like chlorine, okay, this one wants to lose two, but this one wants to gain one. So we've got something weird going on there. So what can happen is one electron can transfer across. So I can get my chloride ion. But I've also got another electron here because I've lost one. But So this magnesium still isn't happy. So what happens is I have another chlorine. So I have one magnesium two plus, which makes it that, and two uh, one minus ones, okay? Uh, yes, do put brackets because the whole thing has charge, okay? So this is actually why the formula for magnesium chloride is MgCl2, because I have one magnesium and two chlorines, okay? Cool. Um, that's ionic bonding, okay? Then we've got covalent bonding. Now... This is um, this is where you have a share of electrons. Okay, so um, <clears throat> if I take uh, something like uh, oxygen, okay. Now the key for covalent bonding is you've got sharing. Um, this is the one which kind of looks a little bit like a Venn diagram, okay? And also, the key here is to think about which ones are lonely, okay? This is why we draw it in the way we do it with the 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 9 o'clock thing, okay? Because you can see here that I've got one lonely electron and another lonely electron. If I take something like hydrogen, okay? Now, hydrogen's the weird one because, remember, it's only got the first shell, so it needs two in its shell, so that means it only needs one more electron. And again, this is why you can think of it as lonely. It's got one lonely electron on its own. 
So what happens is this lonely electron sees that lonely electron is like, cool, let's hang out. Let's feel a little bit less sorry for ourselves. Okay. And we get that type of affair. And you can see there's another one here. So another hydrogen can come in and we've got that. Okay. And that is water. Okay. That is water. You've got H2O. Um, let me do an, a couple more quick examples. If I take something like carbon, which has got four in its outer shell, because it's in group four, uh, hydrogen again, I can get four of them coming off. Like that, okay? Now, um, you can now, as well, instead of drawing a dot and cross, you can draw these in another way, where each pair of electrons uh, joined, you can draw as, as a line. So, uh, you might often see that written like this because I've got an H linked to an O linked to an H. That's what those lines means. Okay. Here, okay, I've got that. Okay. Cool. Um, the other version of this. Okay, is if I take, uh, is that the same for hydrocarbons? Yeah, it is. Um, and yes, I'm working on the Caden thing. You can be quiet about it now. Um, if I uh, take oxygen, okay, um, that was methane, yes. Um, if I take oxygen, I've got two lonely ones, okay. Um, so if I have two oxygens, Okay, with my other two lonely ones, what happens is they're like, okay, we'll both kind of all hang out. We'll all hang out together in one kind of party. Like all the lonely people will hang out. It's kind of like one of those like Match.com kind of singles party they see like kind of advertised. So what happens is they all hang out together, right? So I get let's make these crosses to make it easier. Okay, um, these two lonely ones will hang out in the middle. These two lonely ones will hang out. And those pairs, they're still happy, so they're just going to chill over here as pairs. So there's something a little bit different there, okay? Um, there's something a little bit different because um, you've got um, four hanging out in the middle. So this is actually what we call a double bond. And if I was to draw that using the lines, that would be... O and then two lines like that. Okay. Um, two more variations. If I had a uh, carbon, okay, it's got four lonely electrons. Uh, oxygen, we've said, has already got two. Now, what happens is because uh, I can have two lonely ones from the oxygen match up with two lonely ones from the carbon, and I can have another two on the other side. So, uh, carbon dioxide is actually probably, in my opinion, one of the hardest ones to do. Okay, so I have two lonely ones from there. And the two lonely ones from there and we've still got those pairs already back there chilling two lonely ones two lonely ones and the pairs sitting back there chilling okay so this one here is carbon dioxide and if i drew it it's like that okay uh one more version is you could have actually i'll do it on here um if you have uh, nitrogen, which has got five electrons, okay, three here. I've got three lonely ones, so they all hang out together if I had a pair of them. One, two, three, one, two, three, and then that one pair either side is happy, okay? That right there is a triple bond. That's actually really... Um, yeah, that's it. Okay, metallic bonds are super easy. Okay, all you need to do is draw a box. Okay, and in that box, you draw rows of positive ions. And around those positive ions, you have delocalized electrons. Like that, okay. You, um, like that. So you have delocalized electrons, 
And that's a really important word. What that means is it doesn't just stay in one place. And um, um, and that one there is uh, positive ions. So you have these rows of positive ions and these negative delocalized electrons. Okay. So um, we're now ready. So now we've done all the different bonding. We're ready to go back to this diagram. Okay. Um, this is, I'm going to go through this diagram and then it's going to be, I'm going to go away. Um, this diagram what I'm going to go through is if you can follow it through, answer any structure and bonding question. Okay. In terms of the properties. So we've talked about metallic bonding and we've got this delocalization of electrons. Ionic, we did the swap and I showed you them. Covalent, the share and I showed you them. So, first thing to notice is that um, metallic bonding always makes what we call uh, metallic giant metallic structures okay and if it asks you to draw a diagram of them okay you would draw that what we've just drawn okay okay um so Right, seriously, just chill with the chat. I can't bother to like mod it. I've got, I'm just going to do this. It's 20 to 9 on a day where I don't have to do any work. Well, I do have to do work, but what I mean is, you know, it's my evening. Um, the properties of this is it conducts electricity really well. Okay. And it also um, is uh, malleable. And it's also got a high melting point and boiling point. And the reasons for that are all to do with the structure. So, um, I forgot to just wrote metas. There we are, metals. Um, okay. So, um, the delocalized electrons can move about. So, if I see whacked a positive charge and negative charge there, which I would do in an electrical circuit, all the electrons go boing, over here to the positive. Happy days. So, the reason it conducts electricity is because of those delocalized electrons. Okay. Malleable. You can see here I've got these rows of ions. Well, if I took a hammer, okay, I can shove a layer across, and you can see here, let me just uh, imagine what that would look like. OK, and what's happened is it shifted it along. So that's actually quite easy to do. So the reason it's malleable is because they are arranged in layers like an ogre. Uh, Shrek is love, Shrek is life. Now, last one here, OK, with a high melting point and boiling point. That's because these bonds are really strong. OK, the electrons act as a really good kind of glue. So um, they uh, they're really strong bonds. And that is why it has a high melting point and boiling point. Cool. Ionic bonding. Okay. I'm going to do it over here for. Oh, no, I've ruined the color scheme. Disgraceful. Um, okay. Uh, ionic bondings always form a giant. Oh, it's the wrong blue as well. Uh, giant ionic lattices. Okay. The properties of them. Okay. Uh, firstly, um, it's. Uh, is really high melting point and boiling point. Um, it uh, has um, uh, it is uh, it conducts electricity. Uh, when molten or dissolved. Okay. So if I go back to our ionic bonds over here, now I've done this swap and I've ended up with these ions. But if you think about it, I've got kind of positives and negatives all hanging out. And what happens is I can start to build up a kind of giant kind of structure where I have kind of positive here. Negative around them like that. 
that should be on there. Okay, so we've got this kind of giant structure going on like this. Okay. So, um, and we'll say they're positives and then the negative. Um, why has it got a high melting point and boiling point? Okay, well, those positive and negatives attract each other really well. So it um, it does it has strong electrostatic attractions. So if it says, why is it that sodium chloride has a high melting point and boiling point, strong electrostatic attractions? Okay, why does it conduct electricity? Well, I've got positives and negatives here, okay, but they can't move as a solid. So um, you've got charges okay which can move when molten or dissolved so if this is a liquid the positives and, and negatives can kind of move around all over the place um, if it's dissolved it can move around all over the place boom okay covalent okay there's two options for covalent and this is actually where all the kind of quest they love to ask about this okay i've got simple covalent and i've got giant covalent okay so um for simple covalent they weirdly have a low melting point and boiling point OK, um, that's the main thing of interest with simple covalent. If they ask about electricity, they cannot conduct electricity. OK, uh, giant covalent, on the other hand, I'm going to draw them further down so I can explain them. Uh, giant covalent have a high melting point and boiling point. Uh, they are strong. Um, and the couple of other ones here is uh, graphite. If I take graphite in particular, OK, that can conduct electricity and it's also weirdly soft okay right let's go through these now simple covalent weird thing okay if i take water okay if i take two water molecules then the bonds between the atoms those are the covalent bonds okay between the oxygen and the hydrogen there are these weak intermolecular forces between the molecules okay i'll write that out a little bit nicer okay um so the reason that simple covalent molecules have a low melting point and boiling point okay is because um they've got these weak intermolecular forces so even though covalent bonds are super strong You've got weak intermolecular forces. They're easy to break, and that's what gives it a low melting point and boiling point. Why can they not conduct electricity? You've got no charged particles. Okay, there's no electrons, delocalized electrons kicking about. There's no ions. So why can I say that covalent bonds are really strong? Well, the way we know that is because of the giant covalent, okay? If I take something like diamond or uh, diamond, okay, diamond is super strong, strongest material known to man, okay. Okay, I've got all these linked uh, atoms, okay. So the reason it's got a high melting point bonding point is because you don't have intermolecular forces anymore. It's all, all strong covalent bond. It's all strong covalent. And that's, again, why it's strong as well. Okay. If I uh, look at graphite, okay, graphite, you have these uh, layers like this. Okay. Uh, so I've got these rings, and I'll have another layer underneath. Okay, uh, the reason why it's really soft is because the layers can slide over one another. So the reason it's soft is you've got the layers can slide. Um, the reason why it can conduct electricity is because if you look at diamond, each carbon atom 
is actually connected to four. I know these this one these ones aren't. They would be, but I just have only drawn this. Each carbon atom here is connected to four, and that's actually how much it wants to be connected with. Uh, when I did the covalent uh, thing a second ago, okay, we saw that they were connected to four, right? In graphite, they're actually only connected to three. So that actually graphite has uh, has delocalized electrons between the layers. Um, so graphite is basically the only non-metal which conducts electricity because you've got these kind of uh, layers. Cool. Right. Last thing, because I've done this and that's the main thing. We're going to use this to answer an exam question. OK, uh, let me find it. Um, I want to find last year's higher paper. That's it there. Last year's higher paper was, uh, right, this is just, this is how much, how many marks you can get if you just follow that diagram which I've drawn, okay? Um, so, this question, it says, this question is about structure and bonding, okay? Uh, shows the part of structure and bonding in diamond, explain why diamond has a high melting point. So, diamond uh, is uh, an allotrope. Allotrope is a form of carbon, okay, and it forms a giant covalent structure. And I've said here that giant covalent structures have a high melting point and bonding point because they have no weak intermolecular forces. They're all strong covalent bonds. So, first of all, the thing to say is uh, uh, diamond um, forms a giant covalent structure. with covalent bonds between carbon atoms. Okay. Next point is um, is saying that these covalent bonds are strong. Um, and take uh, a large amount of energy to break. Therefore, diamond has a high melting point. Okay. Um, so all we've done there is uh, is follow the diagram. Okay, we've said. Um, that we've got no, it's a giant covalent structure, no weak intermolecular forces, all strong covalent, and therefore it's got a high melting point and bonding point. Boom, three marks, love a job. Okay. Um, uh, where did I put the next one? Oh, this is kind. This is Kaj. Where? Why have I done it? Five point one. Ah, five point three zero. Where's five point two? Then there it is. Cool. Boom. Right. Okay. Uh, figure six, so structure and bonding is sodium chloride, okay, um, where you've got um, chloride ions and sodium ions. Uh, explain the conditions needed. So first thing to do is go back to my lovely diagram, okay. This is a giant ionic lattice, okay, and it conducts electricity when molten or dissolved. Um, and that's because the charges can move when molten or dissolved. So explain the conditions needed. Well, first of all, um, you can say that uh, sodium chloride... Um, is a giant ionic lattice formed from positive. Um, you can you can put in those positive sodium ions if you want. Uh, positive sodium ions 
and negative uh, chloride ions. Okay, these are tracked, okay, um, and that can actually conduct electricity because the positive and negative can move, okay. Um, when molten, so that means melted, or dissolved, uh, these ions can move, okay, and therefore can conduct electricity. The only other thing which maybe you could throw in for if you're really trying to eke out every mark, okay, is um, is to talk about the fact that um, in solids they can't move. Last one, and then I'm going to go away. Um, describe how sodium conducts thermal energy. Right, so sodium, okay, so sodium is just a metal, okay? That's another thing, okay? If you want to work out, if you're not sure what type of bonding it is, remember that metals do metallic bonding. Non-metals and metals combined do ionic bonding, and non-metals on their own do covalent. So um, here, okay, chlorine is a non-metal. Sodium's a metal, so that's ionic bonding. Here, I've just got sodium, so that's just metal, okay? So first of all is you can say that sodium uh, um, uh, forms a giant metallic uh, structure using metallic bonds, metallic bonding. Okay, now the key thing with metallic bonding, remember, is that we've got these delocalized electrons which can move. Okay, uh, this means um, it has delocalized electrons. That can move throughout. Now, we've talked about it in terms of electricity. But if, for instance, I heated up this side, the electrons could move and transfer that heat energy, that thermal energy. So um, that means um, that um, these uh, delocalized electrons can transport or transmit or transfer would be better, thermal energy uh, by uh, moving through the structure and then you've had English today so you always link back to the question therefore sodium conducts thermal energy well <sighs> okay right uh, I know we had a bit of initial faff uh, with the camera not working. Um, I hope you found this useful and uh, the chat wasn't too annoying and uh, and much as. Um, thanks for putting up with me. Um, if you have anything else that you want me to do, okay, you know, people, you know, you know my email um, and, and all that type of stuff. Uh, cool. Um, thank you. If uh, you obviously can pop in tomorrow before the exam if you like i'm not going to be there ridiculously early but um you know whatever whatever you need cool cheers guys and girls obviously